and welcome back to part two of our look at the Fay source code. Where we left off last time was looking at this Fay dollar sign dollar sign underscore function, which forces a thunk. So there's not really much to a thunk, even though it has an unfamiliar name. It's just a way of storing something in an unevaluated form. And you can see that it's a pretty simple function. It just recurses over the thunkish argument, forcing it if it's a thunk until it reaches a non-thunk. And a thunk is down here, and it's just an object with two variables, one indicating whether it's been forced already and the other with the value. And the force function calls the value variable as a function which gives us the clue that thunks are stored as functions, which is a way of keeping them in an unevaluated form. And that's all there is to thunks, but just looking at the code may not explain uh, quite well enough what's going on. So let's take a look at an example and also see why thunks are useful and why Fay was implemented this way. We'll switch back to our test file and change it a little bit. So in order to use thunks or to see them in action, we need to do something with some lazy code. And I think one of the best examples of this is infinite lists. Now, since uh, Fay has certain native JavaScript data types, I'm going to make sure that we explicitly uh, create this as an int list. And then to make it interesting, let's go ahead and uh, map a function over this infinite list. And let's say we'll take the first three elements of the list and then we'll uh, sum those together. And then uh, we'll go ahead and show that in the console. Let's compile that like before. And uh, I guess uh, put string isn't defined since you can only write to the console a line at a time. And now before we run the example, let's add some tracing to this uh, force function. We could try and look at what's going on in the firebug debugger, but so much thunking and forcing is happening that it would take us a long time. So instead, let's um, just log to the console ourselves and try that. So we'll bring up the example again, uh, get firebugs so we can see the console and reload it. And let's detach this so we can see more at a time. So you can see that there are all of these values that have been forced. Some of them still aren't in their most basic form yet. Uh, here is a fay list, which is a cons. And if you're familiar with lisp, you'll know what the car and cutter stand for. But if you're not, it's like the head and tail of the list. Uh, but that's not important for what we're looking for here. What we're looking for is what's going on with this summation over this mapping of this list. How is Faye mapping over this infinite list and then taking just some of the elements and summing them up? And presumably the only way to do that is by just forcing the values from the list that we need. Let's switch back to the source one more time just to get an idea here of what might be going on. Rather than the map running over the entire list, this take three is going to force this sort of unevaluated list. It's going to force the first three elements of that list. The rest of them can remain as an unevaluated thunk. So we can kind of see that a few of the elements might be coming out here and getting summed up before we get the answer of 12. But it's not exactly clear with the sequence of what's happening. So it might be a little bit easier to see it if we increase the number of items that we take and hopefully a pattern emerges. So let's rebuild that 
And again, uh, we need to reinsert the logging code here. And then this time, uh, let's see what we get. All right, so we have a lot more uh, iterations of whatever's going on here that we can look at. And the end result is 930. And you can kind of see more clearly what's going on now. The system is sort of keeping this running sum because sum is implemented as a fold here, which don't worry about uh, what exactly that means. But you can see our old sum of 12 here and moving from the third to the fourth item of the list, we multiply that by two to get eight and sum it to 12 to get 20. And from there, we move on to the fifth item, multiplied by two is 10, added to 20 is 30, and so on. And you can see this pattern through all the way up until 930. So I know that doesn't give you a perfect look at what's going on but hopefully it gives you some idea of what's happening with thunks, and that's really what I wanted to get across. So we've looked a little bit at the JavaScript runtime of Fay, and we could keep going deeper, but let's go ahead and switch over to the Haskell side and see what's going on there. The thing that I'm most interested in learning about with Fay is how exactly it's leveraging the compiler to generate JavaScript code. And I'm just going to start at the top and see where this takes us. So in the main part of Fay, there's some ways to run things interactively. Uh, but what I'm looking for is this main part of the code that calls compile from to. So let's see. I've kind of given up on hashtags for the moment because they've been giving me some problems. So we'll just stick to grepping for now. And compile from two is defined in fay.hs. And you can see that's defined in terms of compile file, which I expect to be here. Compile file with state. And this looks interesting. You can see that this is building the file we expect. It's taking the JavaScript runtime it's taking the actual uh, file we have here as Haskell or Fay code and kind of bundling them together. So it looks like the next step is this compile top level module, which uh, we can search for. And that is in fayCompiler.hs. And here in compile top level module, we still haven't gotten to what I'm looking for, but there is something interesting. And this this call to type check. So let's uh, search for that again. And that's in compiler type check dot HS. And the comment here says call out to GHC to type check the file. So we'll come back to this, but this gives us a clue that Fay isn't actually directly using GHC to compile the code. And I realize that we've gotten to a point where there's no more likely candidates here that are compiling the file. And if I look at the type signature of this module, the input's not a file or a string, it's a module. So that's a little bit strange. It looks like something that's already been compiled. So let's go back up a level to compile file with state. And instead look at this compile to module and compile via string, which uh, I guess we can search for. And that's in compiler.hs. And here we have a call to parse fay, which looks promising. Um, I keep going for the tag instinctively rather than a grep. And parse fay is in miscellaneous. 
and then there is parse with mode which if we search for it uh, we're not actually going to get any results and that's because this is part of the Haskell source with extensions module for parsing Haskell source so Haskell source with extensions is a package that provides a parser for Haskell source code. One of the really nice things about working with Haskell is that there's so many of these meta level tools for dealing with Haskell source itself. From this package that provides a ready-made parser to things like template Haskell, uh, there's a lot you can do, and if you've worked in another language like, say, PHP, where there's, there's not really many things you can do for static analysis and parsing of the code, you'll really appreciate this. So before we go deeper into what Fay is doing, I think it might be worth taking a look at how Haskell source with extensions works by making a simple Haskell to abstract syntax tree program showing it off. And since I've been using Cabal Dev uh, so much lately, we might as well create a Cabal file just for this little project here using Cabal init. And we'll just go with the uh, defaults on everything here. So the only thing we need to make sure we do is choose executable. And now we should have a cabal file that we can customize. So we're going to want the Haskell source with extents package, and then we'll need to define what the uh, main module is. And we'll just use main.hs. And here, let's go ahead and make a program that takes a file name as an argument, so args, and rather than uh, check that we only received one argument, we might as well just iterate over all of them. So for each of these files, we'll go ahead and uh, parse the file. Uh, print out a representation of what we get. So let's take a look at the docs just to see how we parse the file. And you can see there the first function here, parse file, takes a file path and gives us a parse result. So we'll use that. So parse file on the uh, file here actually. Keep those variable names descriptive. And we get a parse result, which is OK or failed. So we don't get the AST right here. We get a result. And if the result is OK, let's see, we get the uh, value. Then we'll do this. If not, uh, we get the location and an error string. And we'll just call error. We could output the error and continue going through the files, but this isn't really production code anyway, so this should do. So we're going to need the Haskell, let's see, the module name is well, the top level module name is Haskell dot, sorry, language dot Haskell dot exts. And we're also going to need system dot environment to get the arguments and control dot monad to get the 4M that we used. So let's give that a try. Compile dev install. And since things never work the first time with me, uh, Cabal actually treats a missing license file as uh, 
fatal error. So let's try that one more time. And now we have an executable. So if we run it from the Cabal Dev um, directory with no arguments, it should do nothing as expected. And then if we run it on the main file itself, we get an abstract syntax tree of the program. So you can kind of see what's going on here, uh, but it would be a lot nicer if we could pretty print this. And fortunately, the uh, extents package has pretty printing inside of it. So let's see if we can find the function to use. Uh, let's try pretty print. So instead of show, we'll use pretty print AST and rebuild it and run it again. And this isn't exactly the kind of pretty printing that we wanted. It looks like it's just putting out the file itself. You can see that it's not doing exactly that. The indentation has changed. This is sort of the normalized source. There's an actual explicit main module declaration that we didn't have in ours. But this still doesn't give us the actual you know, tree that we're looking for. And for that, there is a package called pretty show, which is sort of like just calling show, um, but instead puts things on multiple lines. And it is exposed through the module text.show.pretty. So let's rebuild this again. And it's building a Haskell lexer because the way that this works is it actually parses the result of show and then converts it into a nicer format. Since show is actually a, a serialization format really for Haskell. So let's take a look at this now. And this is sort of what we're looking for uh, a little bit more. You can see here the module and the name main, the import declarations here, uh, language.haskell.x, system.environment, control.monad. You can see the type signature for main and what the rest of the code looks like. And all of these constructors here, like uh, app, qualifier, case, and so on, might be worth the effort of learning if you're planning on doing a lot of work with parsing Haskell files in the future. They come into play, for example, when you're using template Haskell, although they might be named a little bit differently. So what's the point of all this and showing you this? Well, it's because Faye here is using uh, exactly this approach to parse the Fay or Haskell file uh, that it's getting. And on top of that, it's going to do pattern matching to take this abstract syntax tree and convert it into JavaScript. So really, Fay is actually a full compiler. The only way that it's leveraging GHC is for doing the type checking. You can see in the type checking, function that it actually calls out to GHC on the command line. So Faye didn't have to implement all the machinery of doing type inference and so on. It, it has a simpler job of compiling code. But as opposed to a project like, say, GHCJS, which sort of uses an intermediate output form from the compiler itself, Fay is just using the Haskell source with extensions library to parse the code and then transform it itself. So let's quickly see if we can find an example of that in the compiler. Let's just pick a declaration somewhat at random here. And you can see that there are a number of functions here that take uh, declarations, which are a constructor for the abstract syntax tree that Haskell source with extensions outputs and produces a list of JS statements. 
So here's compiling a declaration, compiling a top-level pattern binding, compiling a data declaration, and so on. And to really see what's going on with that would be really involved. It would take a lot longer than we have left in this episode, and possibly more than even an additional episode could contain. So if you're really interested in the inner workings of compiling a Haskell-like language to something else, you are probably going to have to read through this yourself. Hopefully, though, with even the high-level overview we've taken of the code and the limited look at the internal workings, you've got a better understanding of what exactly Fay is doing, and you've been exposed a little bit to, at least conceptually, how a Haskell compiler deals with being non-strict, and if you ever have a project where you need to parse Haskell source, you've got to look at what may be involved. I hope you've enjoyed these episodes as much as I've enjoyed making them, and if you have a suggestion for a Haskell or JavaScript program you'd like to see deconstructed, I've gotten a couple so far, and I know that while I can't do all of the suggestions, it at least gives me a better idea of what people are really looking to understand. I'll see you next time, and as always, thanks for watching.